Hey guys, today I want to present a solution to the hardest problem from this year's IMO, which was problem number six. First of all, let's take a look at the problem statement. We have given a function f from the rational numbers to the rational numbers such that the following is true. If we take arbitrary rational numbers x and y, then at least one of the two equations is true. The first is f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y, and the second one is f of f of x plus y equals x plus f of y. A first thing that we can notice when looking at these two equations is that if we take a look at the second one, then we can get this one by swapping x and y in the first equation. The problem asks us to find the maximum number of values the expression f of r plus f of minus r can take. For better notation, I want to give this expression a name and call it g of r. We can directly notice that g of r is also equal to g of minus r. Secondly, let's denote this assertion here with p of x, y. Before I start with the solution, I want to note that in the actual paper, the students were also asked to prove that this number here is finite. So they could work with that knowledge. We start by taking a look at p of x, x, because then we see that both of these equations here are equal. So since at least one of them is true, we get that both of them are true and we conclude that f of x plus f of x is equal to x plus f of x. In other words, x plus f of x is a fixed point of our function. Taking x equals zero in this equation implies that f of f of zero is equal to f of zero. Let's try to further investigate the behavior of f of zero. We start doing this by taking a look at p of f of zero, zero. This implies that f of two times f of zero is equal to f of f of zero, or that f of f of f of zero is equal to two times f of zero. We can use this equation here to simplify these two terms to f of zero. The right equation directly implies f of zero is equal to zero. But for the left equation, it is not so clear. So let's try to figure out more about f of two f of zero. This can be done by taking x equals f of zero in this first equation here to get that f of f of zero plus f of f of zero but this f of f of zero is just f of zero, so we have two times f of zero is equal to two times f of zero. Hence, we also get that f of zero is equal to zero for this first equation here. In total, we can conclude from this argument that f of zero is equal to zero. Our next goal is to use this equation. And we can do this by getting one of our arguments here in this assertion to be equal to zero. This can be done by just taking x equal to minus f of y. So let's try to consider p of minus f of y and y. We get that f of 0 is equal to f of minus f of y plus y, or that f of f of minus f of y plus y is equal to zero. The first equation directly implies that the right hand side is equal to zero. For the second equation, it would be cool to figure out more about arguments for which f of this argument is equal to zero. So let's take a look at a number set such that f of z is equal to zero. Taking a look back to this equation here, we see that f of z equals zero implies that f of z is equal to z, and therefore we directly get that z is equal to zero. So the only zero of our function f is zero. Hence, in this line here, the second equation also implies that this term is equal to zero. Therefore, we can conclude that f of minus f of y plus y equals zero, or in other words, f of minus f of y is equal to minus y. This equation directly implies that f is both injective and surjective. 
Note that the important step for this implication here was that both of these equations here imply the same result. This was due to the fact that f of 0 is equal to 0, so 0 is a fixed point of our function f, and because f attains 0 at no other value. It would be great if you could find other rational numbers different to 0 with the same properties to do a similar argument. For doing this, I want to denote a to be the set of fixed points of f. Note that in the beginning of our solution, we already figured out that x plus f of x is an element of a. Let's now consider an element a and a and try to replicate this approach here. Namely, we consider p of a minus f of y and y to get f of a is equal to f of a minus f of y plus y or f of f of a minus f of y plus y is equal to a. Since a is a fixed point and f is injective, in both equations we can conclude that a is equal to f of a minus f of y plus y. Rearranging gives that this is equivalent to f of a minus f of y is equal to a minus y. To get rid of this f inside the argument here, we want to use this equation we figured out earlier. So let y be equal to minus f of x. The left side is then equal to f of a plus x, and on the right side we have a plus f of x. To apply this fact, we have to find a suitable fixed point for a. But luckily, we already found some of them. This allows us to rewrite the left-hand sides of our original equations. Namely, we can write f of x plus f of y to be equal to f of x minus y plus y plus f of y. Here we see that y plus f of y is a fixed point, and therefore, by using this equation, this is equal to f of x minus y plus y plus f of y. This implies that our given equation, f of x plus f of y equals to f of x plus y, is equivalent to f of x minus y plus y plus f of y equals f of x plus y. And now we can rewrite this to f of x minus y is equal to f of x minus f of y. Therefore, we can write p of x comma y in a new form, which I will do on the top of the blackboard. We now know that at least one of these two equations here is true. They are pretty close to the Cauchy functional equation, which says that f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y. But here we have two minus signs instead of plus sign. So at first we have here x minus y and then we have minus f of y. Our goal is to now plug in suitable values for x and y such that at least one of these two equations is equal to the Cauchy functional equation. We can achieve this by using x plus y instead of x in these equations here. p of x plus y and y implies that f of x is equal to f of x plus y minus f of y, or we get that f of minus x is equal to f of y minus f of x plus y. Solving both of the equations for f of x plus y, we indeed see that on the left hand side we have the Cauchy functional equation, so f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y, and on the right side we have f of x plus y equals f of y minus f of minus x. The cool thing about this observation is that the left hand side is symmetric in x and y, while the right hand side is not symmetric in x and y. This means we can swap x and y to get the same first equation, but the second equation changes, and therefore we get more information out of this. To write it down, let's consider p of 
x plus y and x. This gives us that f of x plus y equals f of x plus f of y, or our second equation f of x plus y is equal to f of x minus f of minus y. These two statements here together imply that either the Cauchy equation holds or both of the equations on the right hand side are true. So we either have that f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y or we get that f of y minus f of minus x is equal to f of x plus y which is equal to f of x minus f of minus y. The amazing thing about our right equation is that by rearranging it, namely bringing f of minus x to the right and f of minus y to the left, we see that f of y plus f of minus y is equal to f of x plus f of minus x, which implies that g of y is equal to g of x. The even better thing is that g is an even function and therefore we can replace x and y by minus x and minus y without changing anything in the statement that g of y is equal to g of x. But the left hand side changes this time. We get that f of minus x minus y is equal to f of minus x plus f of minus y or that we have again the same result on the right hand side. So g of y equals g of x. Combining these two statements here, we get that g of y is equal to g of x, or both of the equations on the left side hold. And now we can add these two equations together to get that f of x plus y plus f of minus x minus y is equal to f of x plus f of minus x plus f of y plus f of minus y. This left equation here is now just equal to g of x plus y is equal to g of x plus g of y, which is a pretty cool statement. I want to remind you again that g is an even function and therefore we can change the variables x or y to minus x or minus y with only changing the term g of x plus y. We conclude that either g of y is equal to g of x or we have that g of plus minus x plus minus y is equal to g of x plus g of y. Let's bring this statement to the top of the blackboard and see if it gives us an upper bound on the number of values g can attain. If we are only in the right case here then we see that g must be a constant function and therefore this number would be equal to 1. So let's try to figure out what happens if we find x and y such that we are not in the right case. For doing this, let's consider u and v such that g of u is not equal to g of v. We get that g of u plus v is equal to g of u plus g of v. It would be even better if g of u plus v is not equal to both of the summons of the right hand side because then we can use the x equals u plus v and y equals u to get a similar equation but not exactly the same. To be in this case it's enough to additionally assume that both g of u and g of v are not equal to zero. This directly implies that the right hand side here is not equal to g of u and also not equal to g of v. Using x equals u plus v and y equals u and subtracting y from x on the left hand side here. This statement tells us that g of v is equal to g of u plus v plus g of u. Adding up these two equations here imply that 0 is equal to 2 times g of u which implies that g of u is equal to 0 which is clearly a contradiction. In other words, we have found out that g cannot attain two different values not equal to zero, or that g can only attain the value zero and at most one other value. So the answer to our question 
this is less than or equal to 2. By taking f to be the identity function, we clearly see that 1 works. But now the last question to answer is if 2 is also possible. So let's try to create a function such that g is not a constant function. And for doing this, let's take a look back to this equation here, which tells us that f of a plus x equals a plus f of x for fixed points a of f. To make our life easier, let's at first only work under the assumption that a equals 1 is a fixed point of f. This allows us to rewrite our function f in the following way. Namely, we can write f of x to be equal to f of now the floor of x plus the fractional part of x, which is now equal by this equation to the floor of x plus f of the fractional part of x. It is left to determine f on the fractional part. And here, our first guess may be that f of the fractional part of x is just a linear function, so this is equal to c times the fractional part of x. This is especially motivated because of the fact that we have seen the Cauchy functional equation at some point before. Plugging this in into our functional equation on the top left corner, we get that f of x plus the floor of y plus c times the fractional part of y should be equal to the floor of x plus c times fractional part of x plus y. We can bring out the integers on our left hand side to get that the left hand side is equal to the floor of x plus the floor of y plus f of fractional part of x plus c fractional part of y and the right hand side can be written as floor of x plus floor of y plus fractional part of y plus c times fractional part of x. The floors can be cancelled on both sides. Taking a look at the remaining terms, we see that it's only possible to work with c equals to 1 or minus 1. If c is equal to 1, then we see that f is just the identity function. And that's not what we want to work with. So let's take a look what happens if c is equal to minus 1. Our equation becomes f of fractional part of x minus fractional part of y equals fractional part of y minus fractional part of x. This is true if the argument on the left hand side is between 0 and 1. Or in other words, if the fractional part of x is greater than or equal to the fractional part of y. If this inequality here doesn't hold, then we have the reverse inequality, implying that the second equation here is true. And therefore, in any case, at least one of these two equations is true. Hence, we have found a non-trivial function satisfying the given conditions, namely f of x equals floor of x minus fractional part of x. We directly have that g of 0 is equal to 0. And now let's take a look if we get a second value for g. For this, let's just take an arbitrary non-integer number. For example, let's take a look at g of 1 half. This is equal to f of 1 half plus f of minus 1 half. And now f of 1 half is just equal to 0 minus 1 half. And f of minus 1 half is a plus minus 1 and minus 1 half. In total, this is equal to minus 2, not equal to 0. We therefore have found a function f for which g attains two different values. And therefore, our answer to the question is 2, and thus we are done.